T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, engine, engine start, 1, 0, and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets in some way like our own. Burnier engine chamber pressures are building. Groundlet solid motors are building in chamber pressure. If it weren't for YouTube's music recognition software, right now you'd be listening to Oh Happy Day. And I'd probably be singing along too. When I was a kid, I read an awful lot of science fiction. I considered myself a connoisseur of that particular genre. But as I got to my late twenties, I realized that the things in science fiction books that really turned me on it wasn't the stories, it was those little paragraphs that actually talked about the real science and tried to explain a little to the reader. So I switched from books which contained only a few paragraphs of what I really wanted to books that were filled with nothing but what I wanted. But as a kid, I always knew that mankind wasn't going to stop looking for life outside of itself. This is a remarkable day. The launch of the, the Kepler spacecraft is the first step, serious step, to try and find a place to go. How many planets are there? Some of you who remember what you were taught at school will say nine. Some of you will be like me and they'll pay attention to such stuff. And there are actually, outside of the nine that we know in our solar system, 340. And they're all big because the only way we could detect these planets was if they were large enough and sometimes close enough to their star to make the star wobble imperceptibly. You'd never see it with your eye but modern machinery can detect it. And we know of 340 planets although we've never seen them outside of our solar system. The Kepler mission is capable of detecting a dimming of a star, actually the dimming of any one of a hundred thousand stars that it's going to look at, of one part in ten thousand. And that, we think, is the amount of light dip that one would anticipate from a planet the size of Earth passing in front of the Sun, as seen from another star elsewhere. Also, we, if we look at a star, we can tell what type of star it is, how hot it is, and you can calculate from that how near or far from the star a planet would need to be to have liquid water. So, if we look at a star, say, like the Sun, and we see a 1 in 10,000 dip in the light output of that star once every year, then we'll know that that planet is about the same size and about the same distance from that star as the Earth is. And if there's water there, H2O, it'll be liquid. And that's what, at the moment, we think is the best indicator of the potential, at least, for life. Personally, I think it's out there. I think, uh, I'm tempted to say I know, but I can't say that. But the odds are just so heavily in its favour. Uh, you can see in the background the pale blue dot photo which was taken from the Voyager spacecraft as it left the solar system. Uh, this photo was, was only taken because Carl Sagan nagged NASA into taking it. There was a risk that we'd lose contact with Voyager but Sagan persuaded them that it was worth it because it would be inspirational to see Earth as a pale blue dot and in, I think it was the right move and that's one of the most amazing photographs ever taken by mankind. If you disagree, as we English would say, I'll let you work out what that means. We've already got one or two optical wavelength photographs of planets going around other stars already. The first, I believe, was taken of a planet going around a star called Formal Holt. I'm sure I've pronounced that wrong. 
the planet is a long way out from the star which is why it's not hidden by the glare of the star and why we've been able to see it. I think the star is about 25 light years away. But that's the first, as far as I know, optical photograph of a planet going around another star. Now, although Kepler won't be able to do this, Kepler will just be able to say around this star there is something Earth-sized about the same distance as Earth from the Sun. That's all Kepler will be able to do, but that will be a phenomenal discovery. Even if they only find one, and they might find more, then it depends on the elements that are present there and whether there's a magnetic field to protect the planet from the solar radiation. So it's a first step. It's not going to be a clincher, but we won't stop. If we, if we find something or if we don't find something, we won't stop. There are plans for telescopes capable of take, taking optical photographs of an Earth-sized planet around a, another ne nearby star, probably up to about 100 light years. It'll look rather like the pale blue dot photo of Earth when it comes. It won't look impressive to the weak-minded and the stupid and the simpletons. They'll just laugh it off the way they laugh off everything else. But to those who know a little bit about the subject, it will be, well in my case, I'd, I'd shed a tear for having lived long enough to see it. And, one, and the photographs will just get better and better and better. Successive generations of space telescopes will go and they'll get it. What would be the global psychological impact of seeing a photograph that looks like Earth but clearly isn't Earth? If we see oxygen in the atmosphere of that planet, and we would be able to detect it, we'll, we'll be pretty sure there's life there because oxygen is absorbed by rocks like that. So if there's oxygen in an atmosphere of a planet, something is replenishing the oxygen. And the only thing that we know that can do that on a global scale is life. Not necessarily intelligent life. In fact, I'd say intelligent life is highly unlikely to be anywhere nearby. Otherwise, we'd have picked up radio signals, and we haven't. But life itself is probably all over the house. I've got reason, I mean, one of the reasons I think that is because life evolved here quite quickly. And at the time it evolved, Earth was still a pretty violent place. So it may be that life didn't emerge on Earth once. It emerged several times. Started, got smashed by a comet or an asteroid, started somewhere else. It's just a question, I think, and a lot of other people think of temperature, elemental composition and ratio, and gravitational field. And all of those things would be present on an Earth-sized planet, we think, the right distance from the Sun, their Sun. Now xenophobia isn't a good thing, the fear of the, un of the alien, if you like. But in this case, it, it might be. If the lunatic Christians and Muslims saw a photograph of another Earth with oxygen in the atmosphere, even they would know there was life there. And I dare say they'd get very nervous and frightened, not just about what it'll do to their religious doctrine and their scripture, but they'd have to realise, surely, that they have far more in common with the most devout atheist than with something from another world. And maybe over generations that, that might bring us all together. We might realise that we've got more in common with, e with each other than we think. We might realise that genetically we share so much. We, we may as well be brothers and sisters. So here's to a happy day. And it'll be about three years before we get really positive results from Kepler because it takes time to see the trend of the dipping in the light around these 100,000 stars. But we'll get there. And even if it crashes, it won't depress me because we'll just try and try and try again. <laughs>